all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today two special guests to talk about a recent Medal of Honor recipient, Colonel Paris Davis, and we're going to talk to the guys who uh, I always refer to these kind of guys as uh, Sherpas. They carried a lot of the heavy load up the hill to uh, get this accomplished, as, as did a whole team of people. But we have on Neil Thorne, an Army veteran and uh, researcher extraordinaire. Neil, welcome to Veterans Radio. Thanks, Jim. And we also have with him Jim Moriarty, a Marine veteran, uh, did three tours in Vietnam, He's an attorney working in the mass torts area, a lot of work with uh, veterans and vet- military-related causes. He did a dozen years or so with the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation and finds himself uh, helping out where he can. Jim, welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, thank you, Jim. It's good to be with you. Well, you guys got connected on this uh, project for uh, the Colonel Paris Davis, uh, in, in back in Vietnam 58 years ago, he was a captain um, involved with uh, the Green Berets and Special Forces. Uh, his heroics at uh, the Battle of Bung Son uh, really is what launched this uh, effort to have him recognized and receive the Medal of Honor. But Neil, why don't you uh, give a brief description of... Uh, uh, Colonel Davis's exploits that uh, I think it was a 19 hour battle. Yeah. Um, so Colonel Davis was on his second tour in Vietnam in 1965 and he volunteered to go in uh, to Bong Song, which to that point um, had been under enemy control and we had not been able to get a foothold there. Um, he moved into that area, created a civil, civil irregular defense group, a CIDG group, um, of what they call rough puffs. So they were local inhabitants that were recruited into a small army. So he built an army there, um, along with his fellow Green Berets, their A-team. And their first action out was this Battle of Bong Song. And Colonel Davis led that action, um, engaged and devastated the enemy, and also saved his troops, who he was ordered to leave uh, his wounded at one point, and he refused to do so. Um, and it was a colonel who had ordered him to leave. And at that time, he was a captain, so he refused to to leave his troops. Um, he went out and rescued, personally rescued three of them um, while engaging the enemy, while also coordinating air assets and uh, medevacs um, and artillery on the site. And it's just one of the, uh, if you read the accounts of the battle, it is just one of the most uh, uh, heroic actions um, I've seen. And if I understand it right, Jim uh, Moriarty, he was also injured during this battle. So he's not only recovering guys, he's doing well. He's being shot and injured, but again, won't leave the battlefield, even though told to. Do I have that right? 
Yeah, he was injured several times. He was hit with grenade fragments and lost the ability to use his trigger finger. So he was forced to shoot his rifle with his pinky and he was shot in the leg and he still stayed in the fight. Well, the the accounts of that battle uh, right at that time noted the heroics here. And uh, I should mention that uh, then Captain uh, Paris Davis uh, was one of the first uh, African-American or black special forces officers uh, and serving in Vietnam at that time. And, and this is 1965-ish, so, you know, the country is still dealing with a lot of uh, racial issues. But uh, awards and decorations in the military are all about the, the next guy up the line, writing it up and sending it up. So, uh, Neil, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what happened in, in that 1965 period, about write-ups and, and why it's 58 years later and, and we're only now talking about him being awarded the uh, Medal of Honor. First things uh, that you do when trying to recover or look at any of these medals and awards is FOIA all of the surrounding information. And the National Archives had what they called uh, the Paris Davis Medal of Honor packet. Well, we FOIA'd that and got it back, and it was not a, not a 1965 Medal of Honor packet at all. Um, what it was was a 1969 hearing into his medals and awards and the Medal of Honor. Um, in, that, in those documents, we also found official testimony given to this Army hearing by his commander, Billy Cole, that he had indeed written him up for the Medal of Honor and had taken it to Nha Trang with the 5th Group headquarters at that time. And also we found uh, supporting evidence that this was written up by his commander um, in 1965 interviews with the uh, reporter Charlie Black. Um, there are two instances of him mentioning that you know he'd written Colonel Davis. So that's that's what led to us discovering that this was uh, truly a lost award, that it had been created, the packet and, and paperwork had been assembled. It was put in at Nha Trang, and at that point, it, start, it should have generated a first review and multiple copies would have gone out. They would have gone to Saigon, they would have gone to St. Pac, and ultimately the Pentagon. And no copies were ever found. So that choke point of uh, that choke point at, at group headquarters at Not Trying um, was where we determined, you know, that it had been most likely trashed. Well, because you just don't misplace right, something like right. that. this is this is about the most important thing that's going up the chain at this point. And uh, yeah. you get to the point, I think, as a, an experienced researcher as you are, where, where something doesn't smell right at that point, does it? No, it doesn't. And, and it's not even a small packet at that. It would have probably been at minimum 40 pages. Um, and even our recreated Medal of Honor packet was around 90 so. Well, this is this gets lost, quote unquote, lost in the 1960s, and then just sort of uh, goes away. Uh, nobody talks about it. Um, how does uh, and Jim Moriarty, why don't you jump in here? How do you how do you keep this alive, uh, this issue alive for so long? I know you got involved about eight years ago, but you'd worked on some of these other things. And when Neil called you up and said, "Hey, uh, you want to put your talents to work here?" you said yes. But it had to be like, "Wait a minute, this has been this has been cold for decades." Well, you uh, that's only partially true. In 1969. Uh, there was an inquiry. Uh, Billy Cole, who was a battalion commander, was still alive at that time, and he was pushing this from the get-go. And there was, uh, we found orders that they had been ordered to recreate the uh, award package, but nobody ever saw that award package again. And then in 1981, Billy Waugh, who is probably the most famous or the most notorious, depending on how you look at it, Special Forces CIA guy 
who was one of the people whose parents saved, Billy Waugh submitted a, a um, letter not sworn to that talked about Paris's heroics and, and character. And he tried to keep it alive. And there were, there was an army ranger, you know, there was a whole platoon of Sherpas, as you describe them, trying to keep this deal alive. But nobody really knew where the friction points were, where the obstacles were until Neil got involved in about 2014. Neil had been working on the Gary Michael Rose Medal of Honor uh, rising out of um, Operation Tailwind. And so Neil got involved in that with the team of, I guess, half a dozen mostly former Army guys that were trying to push this thing forward. And Neil turned out to be the most uh, knowledgeable experienced, um, aware of the regulations and the problem guy. And he jumped in with both feet and ended up uh, really taking over the taking over the program because of his vast knowledge. That's when he shows up like a kitten on my doorstep, <laughs> uh, saying. Uh, well, we got this little problem. We need a little sweet, help with. sweet talked him right into it, didn't you, Neil? <laughs> yeah, you know, like a like a complete dumbass. I had completely forgotten about the don't volunteer for nothing. See, so he I was Army. Him. You were Marine. You walked right into it. <laughs> I yeah, knew well, we. I knew it was time to call on the Marines. Well, Neil, Neil, this again. This is one of these things where you go like, it doesn't smell right, it doesn't feel right. Where, what happened? How do you lose two packages uh, of this size? And knowing the regulations as you do, you, times your enemy on these because you're losing yeah. witnesses, you're losing certifications. Tell us about some of those hurdles. Well, we lost uh, uh, Sergeant Morgan was one of the men that was on it. He was killed three months after the action. Um, he was most likely one of the first uh, eyewitnesses. And we had Billy Wall. Billy Wall was still surviving. And we also had um, the testimony of his commander, Billy Cole, who had the foresight to have his daughter um, notarize it, to write it down and notarize it for him. Um, plus, we had all kinds of surrounding uh, supporting evidence, including those 1969 documents the National Archives are holding. And you uh, essentially cre recreated a package. It's not the original. It's not the second go-round. It's a third package, uh, if you will, for the Medal of Honor for Colonel Paris Davis. But no, how how do you get that? Okay, I got a bunch of documents here. How do how do I push that forward? Who is, is this? Where the connections help? Some um, generally, there's there's uh, everything that's required in a packet. So it's a DA form six three eight nomination for award, and it's got to be filled out perfectly. Uh, you have to have signatures of anybody in the chain of command or note. You know where they have, uh, if they're deceased or when they have died. Um, you also have to have a, a proposed narrative or proposed citation. I went in the statement supporting evidence. There's a whole checklist of, of parts that go into any medal and award packet. Um, also the uh, uh, description of the action, the after action reviews, uh, stuff like that. Um, so that's pretty general for any medal or award, any valid medal or award. Um, so once you get all that put together um, in, in a general order, along with a summary, that's when you need to find a member of Congress who is a pass-through. So this falls under the U.S. Code Title 10, Section 1130, which is a process for lost, missing, or downgrade medals and awards. So then we then went up to Capitol Hill to find someone who would not only pass it through, but we were also looking for somebody who would uh, be a champion of it as well. Um, we found some, it's no problem finding somebody to pass it through. Um, and we got in Senator Kane's and Warner's offices to do that for us. And then it's a matter of following up with Fort Knox, which is the awards and decorations branch, the first gatekeeper. 
um, making sure they got it, making sure they understand it, making sure that everything is complete. Um, and a, a, a first kickback is almost guaranteed with anything because that's, that's kind of them doing their due diligence. Um, and then you address that. So it's, it's constantly putting together the packet, getting the packet submitted, making sure it's in the channel, and then babysitting it. And this is really a labor of love for the team that's doing this. This is uh, time that uh, Jim Moriarty's putting in, this time Neil Thorne's putting in, and other people are putting in try, trying to advance this. And you were in, you were involved in it for nine years. Other people had been in maybe longer, but, but really the work the, over the eight, nine years, uh, is there a point at which you say, hey, this is, this is going nowhere? Or uh, you just have to stay on it and believe that in the end you'll be successful? We knew we were in the right from the beginning, and we knew that, that an injustice had been done, and it was still existing. So the thought of giving up didn't occur to us. So let me put this to Jim Moriarty, who probably has to dance a little less than Neil does on on, a, on sensitive issues, because Neil's, as they say, this nationally renowned uh, researcher, and uh, you know Jim's a lawyer and a marine. So you you knew you were in the right on this because there was clearly some biases going on uh, back in the '60s, back in the '80s, even into the here in the. 2000s, the, the 2020. I mean, do you confront those directly? Uh, I know as a trial lawyer, a mass tort trial lawyer, you like to confront things directly. But how do you navigate this to advance it, but confront the biases? Jim, you're asking a pretty sophisticated question. Well, the I'm, go, I'm going I, to a sophisticated guy who grew up in Texas. You, you can deal with this. Uh, I know you can. There's, um, I lived during the 60s. I spent two and a half years in Vietnam. I know what the military was like, and I know what the United States was like in terms of the prevalence of racism in the 60s, in the 70s, and the 80s, and indeed today. So the fact that the first package disappeared could have been an accident. The fact that the second package disappeared, now it's no longer an accident. It's sort of like the Twin Towers. When one fell, maybe it was a navigational problem. When they both went down, it was the deliberate act. Neil and I gnashed our teeth about this because I didn't want to make this case about racism, but also wasn't going to take no for an answer. So... We pussyfooted around the issue when we redid the package in uh, 2015 and 2016, where we didn't hang our hats on the racism issue, but we tried to let the, the reader figure out for themselves what, it, what had happened. Certainly, certainly. Uh, in 2000. 16 and, and 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 it was a relenting unrelenting battle uh i was serving on the board of directors of the marine corps heritage foundation richard spencer uh was secretary of the navy jim mattis was secretary of defense john kelly who i worked for uh was initially homeland security and then he goes over to chief staff of the white house I had the best connections in the administration that I could possibly have, and I was hitting on every single one of them because the idea that this man was not going to be awarded the Medal of Honor for what he did was simply not in my vocabulary. And what I did, I went to went up to Mattis at the, the awards dinner, and I had these two chapters from Billy Cole's memoirs that tell they really tell the history of the Vietnam War um, Schwarzkopf's in there um, Peter Arnett's in there uh, John Wayne's in there, Barry Sadler the legend of the, the Green Beret, I mean it, these two chapters which are only cover a small part of the war really were core history of the war 
And Billy Cole tells this wonderful story about how extraordinary Paris's courage was. And, um, you know, my attitude was anybody's got an IQ over 75 that reads this is going to realize this guy definitely needs to get the Medal of Honor. Well, Neil successfully pushed the, 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 uh, the award out of Knox. The initial uh, naysayer was Fort Knox. And we got it out of there. In fact, we later learned that the, uh, I think it was Ray Epps, who was the acting Secretary of the Army in 2017 or 2018, sent it out of the Army to the uh, Secretary of Defense's office. And that turned out to be where the real hurdle was. There was a what I would, there were two confounding facts. Confounding fact number one is Billy Waugh has spent way too many years with the CIA, and sometimes his stories don't match. And Billy, in his 1981 letter, which was turned into an affidavit in, uh, I think, the early teens, where Billy swears that that uh, Harris saved his life as he did, um, Billy comes out with a couple of so-called books. Uh, one of them was um, Stalking the Jackal or something like that. And in these books, he tells the Battle of Bong Song where he sort of set out to be the controlling hero and he claims some guy named Reinberg saved his life. Now, so the, there's two confounding facts. Uh, one of them is that Billy Waugh says at one point in time, Paris Davis saved my life, at another point in time, Reinberg saved his life. So that was confounding fact number one. Confounding fact number two is that in 1969, four years after the battle, Reinberg is awarded the DSC, and in his DSC citation, it says that he saved the life of a soldier. Now, keep in mind, there's 200 rough puffs um, out there, the South Vietnamese CIDG so soldiers, um, and there were four Americans. I, uh, the, the Silver Star Citation, the interim Silver Star Citation that was issued in 1965 for Paris, specifically credits him for saving the life of his team sergeant. And his team sergeant is Billy Waugh. So in my view, there was no confounding evidence except that Billy Waugh was having a hard time keeping his story straight, but there was so much supporting evidence, Billy Cole's memoirs, other witnesses' statements, um, Billy Waugh's earlier sworn affidavit, that I thought this this Reinberg business was just all bullshit. I thought, you know, nobody in their right mind would think that there's a conflict with who, who parasade because his very silver star citation says it was his team sergeant. There was only one team sergeant on the mission. And what what really proved to be interesting throughout this eight-year battle, as I focused in on finding the, the crew chiefs from the helicopters, finding the pilots from the helicopters, finding the remaining living witnesses from the battle, we literally, and to tell you, the, the length we went to to find supporting evidence, a, uh, I think there was a New York Times story where there was a fact pilot who was describing his part in the mission, and the guy's name was Speedy Gonzalez. So, <laughs> so here, here's all the facts I know about Speedy Gonzalez. He's in the Air Force. He flies uh, Ford Air Controller aircraft. 
and his name is Petey Gonzalez. Like, I'm supposed to do something with that? <laughs> start, well, start searching. Yeah, so I, I, I call Ellen Cousins. We, we lost you, Jim. Neil, do I have you? Yeah, I'm on. Okay, let me see what uh, other. I still. Sh oh no, he got he got dropped. Okay, uh, he is the. No, he's he's supposed to be there. So, okay, let me try this. Jim. Yeah, I lost you there. Yep, let me bring you back in. Uh. Neil? I'm here. Jim? Jim? Okay, I'm here. Okay, there we go. So let's pick it back up. You were talking about trying to find Speedy Gonzalez. Uh, Speedy Gonzalez. A computer researcher about not having the slightest clue where I'm going to find this guy. And all I was doing was just bitching. I wasn't making a request. Well, I go to bed and I wake up the next morning and I've got Speedy Gonzalez's name and address and phone number on my email. And it turns out he's a retired Air Force pilot who lives over in San Antonio. And I jump in the car and drive over to interview him. Oh, my goodness. And I, and I track <laughs> down some of the Huey pilots. You know, the, the pushback, part of the pushback we got is, well, we need more living eyewitnesses. And I'm sitting there going, you son of a bitches have waited 50 years until almost everybody's dead, and now you want more living eyewitnesses? As it, as it turned out, the Reinberg problem was the core problem because there was, in my view, a single individual in the Department of Defense's office who took the position that Reinberg's DSC trumped everything. Now, keep in mind, <coughs> Neil and I have talked to more living witnesses and now deceased witnesses who knew about that mission than any other two people on the planet. And not nobody has ever said anything about Reinberg ever saving anybody. Not Colonel Cole, not, not anybody else on the mission, not Ron Dice, nobody. Not Paris Davis, not this 19. We, we actually tracked down the hour-long Phil Donahue interview with Ron Dice and, and, uh, and Paris, and where Paris tells the whole story about how this deal went down. And you can't watch that without concluding there's a guy who was there who knows what happened and who's describing what happened. Now, of course, you can't be awarded a Medal of Honor on your own testimony. you got to be, be awarded a Medal of Honor based on other people's testimony. But it was certainly cooperative evidence, and, and Ron Dice was a, a direct eyewitness to important facts. But go ahead. I, I wanted to come back to this, how do you break this loose, because this thing got lost a couple of times, then it got hung up at Fort Knox for a period of years, then it got hung up in the... Secretary of Defense's Office of Manpower and Reserve Affairs, for apparently for three years. Then it got hung up in, um, uh, I think, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. How <laughs> Every time it gets hung up, how do you bust it loose, Neil? Well, uh, I, I want to answer that question because I was there when the page was blank. Go we were stopped dead in our tracks in the fall of 2020. We had done everything we knew. We had gone to everybody that had any pull. We had found more witnesses. We had found more facts. And we were up against the wall. Now, we weren't quitting, but we also weren't succeeding. And uh, Chris Miller gets appointed acting Secretary of Defense. And I get a call from now Major General Kevin Leahy who says, look, Miller's a fifth group guy. He's a good guy. Uh, you know, you'd been pushed, I had been pushing to have my son awarded 
uh, a medal for valor for his combat when he was killed, which the army wouldn't grant because he was supposedly working for somebody besides the army. But uh, way he calls me. <clears throat> and so I said, yeah, I'll let, let's go do something. But oh, by the way, while we're there asking for some relief, we need to ask for some relief for Paris Davis. So Leahy calls me back the next day, says, I've talked to Miller. Miller's a good guy. He's on it like stink on you know what. And um, he's going to appoint one of his key aides to work with you on the um, Congressional Medal of Honor for Paris Davis. So he assigns this former JAG officer to work with me. We jumped back in it with both feet, and this time we confronted the racial issue head on. Uh, it was a, um, I had had enough. It was, I just do, don't want to hear. We lost the package twice, but we have no idea what that relates to. Right. Well, right. you know, that's just nonsense. That, that is so incredible. So we jumped in. We did a multimedia presentation. We and by this time there was a team of thousands on the Sherpa team. I get a call from uh, one of my buddies in San Antonio or in Houston, who's a former fifth grade guy, and he's talked a game company executive in Great Britain into doing graphics for us. So, for example, one of the, the key points that we had was that Paris had, had saved another soldier's life two months before Long Song and had been awarded a soldier's medal. I think he's one of only six. Neil would know better Four. than I do. Yeah. Uh, six people have been awarded soldier's medal and medals for valor. Um, so he's, they're doing all these graphics for us. We track down photographs from Ron Dice and other people so we can recreate the mission. And what we also did was we did an overlay of what was going on in the United States at exactly the same time that Paris Davis was so heroically serving our country. Right, right. Um, the, the riots in Selma, the, the, at, famous bridge that they just had the 60th or 58th anniversary of. So we confronted it head on and we did this, this multimedia presentation, which if you haven't seen it, I would certainly encourage you to see it. And we put this whole package together in about six weeks. And then uh, Chris Miller, before uh, Trump went out of office, issued an order that the the uh, Department of Defense was to do a review of this whole process, basically to answer the question, why hadn't this been done a long time ago? And so um, that's what busted it loose. And then the, the really weird deal is that after Trump left office and after the Biden administration came in, then we continued to get a year and a half of pushback. And it was was um, if it weren't for people like Ellen Cousins or Aaron Powers um, or Tommy Shook or Neil Thorne or me or another dozen people, including the media, including General Leahy, including General... Uh, uh, Colonel Miller, uh, Chris Miller, inclu including Al Broadbent, and, and, and absolutely including the media. Uh, we had, uh, I forget whether it was New York Times, the Washington Post, but we had them do a story, and CBS found out about the deal, and CBS did a story. And, I mean, by this time, it's a team of thousands, but we would have never gotten it done without all these sherpas. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I think it, again, 
the general public just sees the award ceremony and says, hey, there's a you know, nice old guy who got it, uh, must done something right. <clears throat> but there's so much more to the story and it interweaves with what's going on in the country um, and and uh, this idea that, and, and some of it's just fortuitous. If, if, if S- Acting Secretary of Defense Christopher Miller wasn't a veteran of Special Forces Group, probably, you know, he had a hundred other things more important to do on his desk that day. So those kinds of fortuitous actions, uh, along with all, everybody's hard work, certainly move this along. You, you mentioned, and, and I've seen certainly uh, a lot of the CBS and other interviews with with Paris back in the day. Um, is that uh, multimedia presentation that you felt was so powerful, is that uh, in the public domain? It is. So I can, you can and find then, it on YouTube, I take it? Uh, I don't think it's on YouTube. But I think it's still hosted out of the United States government website. Oh, really? Okay. Probably should be should be on YouTube. Uh, Neil, will you send Jim the, the URL? Love, love, to, love to have the link, I and uh, I agree with you. It ought to be made uh, publicly available because it will really be impactful. Uh, Neil, you've worked on a lot of historical research uh, finding, you know, military issues and uh, recently a massacre issue within Native American Indians and all kinds of different things. Uh, you, This is your avocation. Uh, where, does, where does this effort rate uh, compared to all the other work that you've done? Uh, I would say at the very top. It, it's clearly way above everything else well you should be Um, you should be really proud of yourself both of you guys should be the whole team should be um does does fighting this challenge for eight or nine years convince you i never want to do this again or does it convince you that the next time i see an injustice i'm going to do the same darn thing well i'm always looking for a bigger dragon Jim, I know you've got a couple well, of dragons that uh, you've got lined up, uh, but but this one's kind of was kind of special, wasn't it? No, it was extraordinary special, and it's a if you ever get a chance to meet Paris Davis, take that opportunity. If you ever get a chance to meet with um, Chris Miller, take that chance. This was I've done, you know, I've been battling the biggest companies in America for more than four decades. And I've had extraordinary successes in my career. This was the most satisfying thing I did in my career. And it was, um, Paris Davis is just one of the nicest people you could ever see in your whole life. And you could sit in a bar and drink with him for days and never have a hint He is as self-effacing and down-to-earth and warm and loving and caring. It's a... um, Paris was so supportive when I lost my son. And, you know, here's a guy who's who's got every right to be very pissed off at our country for how he was treated. And all he could do was to show support for me and my family for the loss of my son. And the fact that my son was indirectly involved with uh, getting Paris awarded the Medal of Honor would have meant a tremendous amount to my son. Uh, Every time I would see my son and talk to him, we'd talk about how we were coming on the Paris Davis deal. And of course, you know, we never dreamed that it was going to take eight years. But, um, Harris is just, he is the epitome of an extraordinarily courageous, remarkably decent human being. And it was the, in my view, it was the honor of a lifetime to have the opportunity to serve him. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. And you've really described what many Medal of Honor recipients are, and they are humble men who have done extraordinary things, but but they, they, you know, served... They knew what their duty was, and they went way beyond it. Um, but getting the award uh, is not about necessarily about uh, their individual recognition or rewards. 
it's really for the community, and we were talking about this earlier, Jim Moriarty, on the uh, getting Purple Hearts for, for guys, and and it's really about uh, what this will mean to Paris Davis's family, uh, the African-American community, the Special Forces community, that much larger recognition that uh, the Medal of Honor uh, provides to folks. And, and I suspect both of you gentlemen have seen that play out with other recipients of, of the medal and are seeing it played out uh, with uh, this particular award to Colonel Davis. Well, I go a little bit beyond that. Every little kid in this country, male or female, uncertain about their sex, black or white, liberal or conservative, deserves to see someone who looks like them recognized for extraordinary service and courage above and beyond the call of duty. We owe it every single one of these people who do that, and we, we, we owe the children of our country the opportunity to see what a real hero looks like. And um, they're not all white. They're not all male. They're not all young. They could be old. They can serve in, in unusual capacities. But the children of our country deserve to see everybody who serves and, and, and uh, aspires to that level of courage. And that's part of what is so uh, satisfying here. And, and, the, the, and, and in my mind, Paris Davis is the perfect recipient because he is such an extraordinarily decent human being who was faced with the loss of his career if he, if he, he, he was faced with the Hobson's choice, do I abandon my men on the battlefield and obey this order? Or do I say, nope, I ain't leaving until all of my men leave with me. And that, uh, that willingness to sacrifice his life and his career to protect others um, is, in my view, what this country is all about. Well, these these uh, men are true he heroes that we should be holding up to our youth and helping get the story out. That's certainly what we're trying to do here on uh, Veterans Radio. Uh, Neil Thorne, we really appreciate the work that you do as a researcher. Uh, we have some common friends who speak very highly of your talents and, and dedication. So, uh, again, we want to let uh, the, the larger audience know of, of that uh, talent and what you put it to. So we really appreciate you spending time with us today on Veterans Radio. Thank you, Jim. It's, it's an honor. And Jim Moriarty, uh, it is clear you are passionate about uh, continuing to help uh, uh, other veterans and, uh, on all sorts of different fronts and the work that the two of you did here, combining talents, uh, different types of talents, but that's what it takes to pu put the whole team together. Uh, your efforts here for Colonel Davis just uh, you know can't can't be measured. Both of you guys are sh Medal of Honor Sherpas at the highest degree, and I'm I'm proud to have uh, had the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thank you for what you're doing, Jim. And again, uh, thanks for all your time today uh, here on Veterans Radio. All right, thank you. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46 also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time, you are dismissed. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.